Okay, I think we're finally ready to go here. You're good. Again, once again, let me apologize for being late. Um, I'm here to talk to you. This is a really kind of special talk for me because I used to I used to be sitting right where you guys are right now. So I, I, I started out here as an intern about 10 years ago, uh, and then I went off and finished my PhD after doing undergrad uh, work at Purdue. And then I, I, I came back after, when I was looking for jobs, I realized that this is, this is a place where the best research in my field was going on, so I wanted to come back and, and be a part of it. So if you guys have any questions about, you know, if you really enjoy your summer here, you want to come back, I encourage you to. Uh, and then if you want to know what the, the transition to graduate school and then coming back as a researcher is, uh, I'd be happy to talk with you. So please let me know. So I think I have uh, one of the coolest jobs uh, that exists. I get to, to make stuff every day, and as an engineer, that's, that's all you can hope for. Um, so what I want to talk to you about is, is give you a broad overview. How many of you are actually working at the MDF this summer? There's usually a couple of you in the audience. Um, and, and, uh, and so there's, there's a lot of good research that's going on at the MDF, um, specifically on 3D printing. And if the, I know we usually do uh, intern uh, tours uh, out there during summer. I, I, I highly suggest you guys come out and take a look at what we've got going on. And so I'm a roboticist, and my background is in developing robots. So you look at additive manufacturing, you say, what is, what is 3D printing? And it's this combination, this really nice combination of material science robotics and manufacturing. So you combine all the three, three things together. Uh, you've got you know, composite materials, you've got novel robotic systems, and you can make parts directly, layer by layer. So the way 3D printing works, you start with a CAD model, you create a, a digital uh, uh, model of what you want to print, you slice it into layers, uh, and then you assemble those layers one by one until you have a complete part. Right? So this is a good question I like to, to ask my audience. Is, uh, when do you think the first 3D printing uh, technology was developed? So, show of hands, uh, let's say 2012. I mean, no? Okay, 2008. A couple hands, uh, 2003. A couple more hands, okay, 1998. Okay, a lot more hands there. All right, 1992. One more hand, about 1988. <laughs> One hand, all right. The answer is 1984, right? So 3D printing has actually been around for a long time. That was when the first process called SLA, or stereolithography, was created. That was created by Chuck Hall. Uh, he's the founder of 3D Systems, which is a company that's still active in the industry today. Uh, and the idea was to do rapid prototyping. So you want to, uh, you want to build a, a part that's a, that's a model of what you, you have, you, you intend to use in your application and check it to make sure it fits <laughs> and that the form is right, right? And so, you know, that, that went for a couple years. Yeah, uh, so the, uh, the reason why you've been hearing a lot about 3D printing now is because of the consumer desktop systems that have come out in recent years. So the popular media has, has grabbed onto the capability of people to print stuff in their homes. It's really exciting. Uh, and the reason why those desktop systems exist is how many how many people know how long a patent lasts? Is it, how long is it? It's a uh, it's 20 years, right? And so, in 1992, uh, Stratasys, which is a, a company that owns about 51% of the market share in 3D printing, patented the fused deposition modeling process. So that's that's the what we call the FDM process. That's melting a, a wire of material. Uh, to, to, to make like a bead of glue and that you lay down layer by layer. And that's the process that all these desktop systems, so 1992 to 2012, right, the patent expires and now everybody can enter this market. And, and so Stratasys was focused entirely on industrial systems for, for you know, places like Oak Ridge. Uh, and then now you can see all these consumer grade desktop printers. Uh, and that's why it's become more popular since 2012. Um, we, we like to use the term additive manufacturing to describe these processes, and, we're, and it's, a signal, it's, it's a signal of the switch between you know, prototyping, which was trying to, to make a, a model of something that you can test for form and fit, uh, to include that this is now ready for prime time, it's ready for production, it's ready for manufacturing. Um, and so additive, 
uh, versus subtractive, right? The way we traditionally manufacture things is we start with a big block of material and then we cut away to get the part that we're interested in. Additive means that we, you know, we add material layer by layer to create the part. And so the materials you can use are plastics, metals, uh, uh, ceramics, which is a now emerging, and composites, which is also emerging. Um, so the, the basic idea is that you go directly from CAD model to physical part. And in doing so, you can, you can make things uh, increase complexity. We like to say complexity is free. Uh, you have less material waste. Uh, you can usually recycle most of the materials you make uh, things out of. Uh, there's a shorter design cycle. So as an engineer, I don't have to have any specific manufacturing expertise. I can just say, this is the part I want, hit the print button, and then it comes out. You know, more or less, there's some, there's some you know, finesse to that. Uh, and you can also reduce part count. Um, so a great example of that, I'll show you another great example, but this is a, a, a hydraulic can that my, my boss, Lonnie Love, has made uh, in the past. And so what you see on the, on the left is, is the actual printed hand, and what you don't see is the internal fluid passageway. So this is an all hydraulic hand, but uh, we print the fluid passageways directly into the structure so that we can reduce the number of, we don't have to have any hoses, we don't have to have any fittings, uh, we can all reduce that into a single part. Uh, so the question is, why Oak Ridge National Laboratory? Why, why would we be a hub of advanced manufacturing and, and 3D printing technologies? And this is what really got me excited about coming back to work here. And, and if you look at the, the energy expenditure of the United States, so the total energy portfolio, about 31% of it is spent making things, right? And so that's, that's factories, that's, that's jobs. And so if you can take, uh, take a new technology that requires less energy to manufacture, right, then you can, you can make a big dent in this, this big part of the energy expenditures of the U.S., right? So that's 12% uh, of the GDP, you know, 12 million U.S. jobs. And so if we, can make, if we can make a dent in life cycle energy it takes to manufacture, then we can really improve the state of, uh, of U.S. competitiveness in, in, in manufacturing. Um, and so how do you do that? Right? So the way you traditionally manufacture, you take raw material, you make it into a big block, uh, you ship that to somewhere where it's going to be uh, machined, and you subtractively mill it to get it to the right shape, and then you get a finished part. Right? And that finished part might not be perfect for the application. And so and a great example is every one kilogram you add to an aircraft is $100,000 over the lifespan of that aircraft. Right? So if you say something as small as like a seatbelt buckle, if I can cut you know, half the weight out of a seatbelt buckle, I can save something like $4 million over the life, lifespan of that aircraft if I replace all of the seatbelt buckles, right? And so looking at a new way of manufacturing, say you started with the raw feedstock, the raw material, you, uh, you, you use an electron beam melting process to come up with an optimized part, something that you couldn't conventionally manufacture, but that's perfect for the application, right? So there's no waste, no waste energy associated with the application. You can save a lot of energy uh, per part, right? Significantly amount, significant amounts of energy. Uh, you cut it by at least a third, uh, cut it into a third of what it was originally, right? And then it becomes, okay, so you can cut life cycle energy. Uh, why Oak Ridge? Uh, well, if you look at what Oak Ridge was traditionally good at, we started by, by making the, the, the manufacturing infrastructure that was necessary to, to make a nuclear weapons for World War II, right? And since then, we've, we've, we've created uh, great uh, uh, facilities based on you know, uh, computational sciences, new materials. Uh, manufacturing has been the, the core of that, of that research for a long time. And so this is the MDF, uh, kind of an overview. You see the NTRC is the first building there, and then the MDF is the second building. Uh, and at the MDF, we focus mostly on additive manufacturing, but we're also uh, focused on carbon fiber composites. Uh, we do that through additive tooling, mostly. And so we'll talk about that pretty significantly. And it's a little bit different than the way the rest of the lab operates, in that we're focused on reducing uh, the risk and accelerating the commercialization of advanced technologies to industry. Right? So being off campus allows us to have a, a forward-facing uh, 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 interaction with industry. So industry can come in uh, at any time and work directly with us. We have industrial partners that live in our facility and we work hand-in-hand -hand with them on challenges. So a lot of our stuff is 
not only just basic research, but also applied research that's getting transitioned directly to industry. And so we do that by, by doing a couple different things. We engage with the entire manufacturing supply chain. So if you look at these processes, there's a material being used, there's a piece of equipment that's being, being uh, used, used to process that material, and then there's an end user, somebody who's gonna use this process to do something. Right? So we try to work with all three of those groups in order to make the, make the thing successful. Uh, and we're also trying to empower American manufacturing. So we do that by training the next generation of scientists and engineers. So companies will come, they'll leave people with us to learn about the technology, learn how to use it, learn how to maximize their efforts, uh, and then we transition that technology directly to them. And one of the other great things is being attached to the lab here. Uh, we have access to, to some of the science tools that, are, that, that you can't have access to any other way. Um, so we, we routinely take parts up to, to Hyper and SNS. Uh, we, we, have, uh, we have some projects ongoing uh, using, uh, trying to use big data to understand models for the manufacturing process. Uh, and we also, you know, this is a very material dependent process for all the different types of additive manufacturing. So we, we try to leverage the advanced materials capability that exists here at the lab. So a little bit more about the MDF. Uh, this is a really old slide. Uh, I think we had 7,000 visitors last year. Um, so you can see there are a lot of eyes on the different projects that we're working on. We, the main uh, way we work with industry is through these cooperative research and development agreements. Uh, and it's where you know, DOE will fund our side of the research and then the industrial partner will fund their side of the research. And so we get to work hand in hand with industrial partners and there's no cost to them. So it's really a great incentive for, for industrial partners to work with us. If you look at some of the capabilities we have, how many of you knew that we could 3D print metal before today? Well, quite a few hands. Uh, so there's, there's a bunch of different technologies for metal additive. Um, we have a bunch of them. We try to we try to collect a bunch of the different types of technologies so that we can understand them and use them for, to develop new processes. Uh, we have electron beam melting. Essentially the way it works is you lay down a layer of metal powder and then you use an electron beam to melt that powder. Uh, and, and you can do that very quickly. Uh, we have laser, laser metal deposition. Uh, so that's, uh, you, you imagine you use a laser to, to heat up a, a piece of metal and start melting it and then you start blowing powder into that weld pool. And then as it goes, you keep blowing more powder into it and it builds up apart layer by layer. Then you also have laser powder bed systems, much like the electron beam system, lay a layer of powder over and then use a laser beam to integrate that layer. Uh, metal binder jetting, which is a little bit different. Essentially, you, you spread a layer of metal powder and then you use a inkjet to, to bind the powder together using a polymeric binder. And then you put it in the furnace afterwards and center it all together. Um, to make a, a final part. On the polymer side, we have a, a bunch of fused deposition modeling systems, which is uh, the technology that I mentioned from Stratasys, uh, but, but has now been, uh, been open source. Uh, we have a, a photopolymer multi-head jetting system, and then I'll talk mostly about our large-scale uh, 3D printing systems, which is uh, my, my main focus of research. Um, so our, you know, our research group was a, was, wasn't really, back when I was an intern, wasn't really focused on additive manufacturing. We're a robotics group, and so we started off um, looking at, uh, at, at, you know, robotic systems for remote handling at Oak Ridge. So if you look at the, the earliest telemanipulators were developed here, um, focused on remote handling of nuclear material, because whenever there's a really dangerous activity, you want to try to isolate people from that dangerous activity, right? So, so what you do is you, you start to say, I, I want to remove the human from this environment. So I make this environment, you know, shielded and protected, and then I give uh, the human operator a way to isolate themselves. So I have a robotic system. So these are all, these are, there's, I think there's still one or two of these around um, on the main campus somewhere. If you can find one, let me know. I think there's one over, over by the Chrome Dome on the other side, but uh, but these were original telemanipulators, but they were all man mechanical, right? So you had these tapes and reels that went over to the other side of the system. And then as, and that's back in the, the 50s and, and 60s, and then later the technology improved, so you can use digital control systems, you can move, you know, you can just have wires connecting the two. Um, and then our group uh, kind of split off from another robotics group here, and we started focusing on, on novel robotic systems. Uh, not necessarily the remote handling, the, the nuclear waste remediation, but 
but, uh, but human amplifying machines, exoskeletons, prosthetic devices, things like that. And we started developing uh, systems that we can no longer manufacture. Right, so it was when this, we were doing this prosthetic work that we were like, well, it would be really great if, if the, the shape of the, the link really matched the human arm. And what if we could embed hydraulic passageways in it? Um, and so that's kind of how we came to additive manufacturing, was as a tool to make uh, novel robotic systems. Um, and so this is an example of some of the previous work. Uh, so how many of you have heard of Boston Dynamics? Right, so they have a, a new robot that was just released last, uh, last week, I think. Um, but their previous uh, human, uh, humanoid robot, uh, Petman, which is before Atlas, um, we made the arms for Petman, the first generation of arms, um, and this was where we really kind of got started doing the added manufacturing for this type of thing. Um, you can see that this is an anthropomorphic hydraulic arm uh, for the Petman pro program, and this was all conventionally manufactured. Right? And so we had I think we had 240 machine components for, for that arm, right? And so this is a hydraulic arm, 240 machine components, <laughs> right? And so we started saying, well, can we do this better? Can we, can we figure out how to integrate fluid passageways in the actuation structures? Can we, can we start putting these arms together in a, in a different way? Um, and so this is uh, kind of what we, we got led to, was you know, integrating these, these pistons with curved fluid passageways, uh, integrated systems, and the other thing that, that additive allows you to do is not only tailor the external structure of a part, but the internal, right? And so, you know, if I'm machining a part, I can only be concerned with the external, right? I can't, I can't say, where I, where I can't reach a machine tool bit, I can't remove material. So with additive, you can, you're, since you're building it up, I can make these lattice structures, right? And so, you see, what's the, what's the benefit? There's always a trade-off between stiffness and weight. How much, how, how much stiffness I need to be very precise and how much weight I need to, to carry around because weight turns into energy, right? And so you say, okay, if I, if I made this conventionally, this is the best I could do. I get a solid palm and it would weigh 857 grams. Now if I you know, use the power of additive, I mesh it, I control the internal structure, I get the same stiffness, uh, but I, I, I cut the weight by, by almost seven times. Right? That means that I have less material that's being used, I use less energy to manufacture it, I have a, a faster build and, and a lower cost. So moving in the direction of complexity actually makes additive manufacturing more powerful because it, it actually takes less time, it, it's less energy, uh, it's great. And so this is uh, one of the later projects uh, that we've been doing uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, we've got the new version of these arms ready to go. Uh, but these were a set of arms that we made for the Office of Naval Research, looking at underwater explosive ordnance disposal on hulls of ships. Um, and so this is a um, a small two degree, a uh, small two arm system, seven degrees of freedom on each arm, uh, which means that it, 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 it mimics the human uh, range of motion. So we can have an operator standing at a station with a telemanipulation uh, system, and they can drive the arms around like they're their own arms. Um, and these are all hydraulic. And I mentioned that the previous generation, as you see down below, it has about 240 components per arm. This one has about 40. Right, so we've taken all those, those you know, hoses and, and passageways and machine components and we combined them into these, these functional structures. And these functional structures have fewer points where you can have leakage, they have fewer points where you have wear, uh, fewer uh, fittings to fail, things like that. And so you can, you can start really optimizing the structure, um, which, we, which we couldn't do conventionally. So this is just a, a quick video of these arms in operation. Um, and you can see how, how the process works. So we've gone a long way since the mechanical tape and reel type systems, and now you can just uh, drive it almost like a video game, where you're, where you're just controlling the, the mimicking set of manipulators and, and driving these around. And so we've got a new version of these arms that are a little bit more powerful, a little bit more responsive uh, that we've been assembling for the last couple uh, months. So if you look at applications for metal uh, AM, I think uh, I laid out a pretty good one for robotic, a real, pretty good case for robotics. Um, but you see it in all these different areas. And so this, uh, the aerospace application is great. Right, so in aerospace they have what's called a buy to fly ratio. How much material you buy versus how much actually flies in the aircraft. Right, and so, there's this company we work with called GKN, and they're, if, you, if you hear about Boeing making airplanes, uh, Boeing doesn't make airplanes, they assemble them. 
right? The, the actual parts are, are made by GKN. Um, and GKN's claim to fame is that they manufacture uh, a million tons of titanium chips a year. So that's waste byproduct from, from manufacturing for aircraft, right? And so and this is a little titanium bracket that goes on the F-35. Uh, it has a buy to fly ratio of 30 to one, right? And this is pretty typical for, for most aircraft applications. So if I'm gonna make this bracket, I start with a block of material and then I cut almost 30, uh, you know, it's 30 to one, so I cut all, almost 90% uh, of it away and I have, uh, or 95% of it away and then I have a, a bracket, right? So that's, that can't be the most efficient way to do this. And so we worked with, with Lockheed on a, on a project we were looking at. Can we, can we design this bracket to be printed uh, and then just do a, a finish machining uh, to get it to the right shape? Uh, and so you can cut it down to about 1.5 to one, right? So that means there's less uh, waste that you have to deal with. There's, it has, it, it's just the same strength. Uh, and so there's a lot of application there. Um, in the in biomedical, uh, they're looking at you know, designing these scaffolding. So this is, a, for example, a hip cup that goes in an implant. So almost all of the, uh, the hip replacements in Europe are being done through additive manufacturing now. Imagine you, were, you, you had a CT scan of, the, of your joint that you're gonna replace. Uh, you, could, you could use that to generate a 3D, 3D model. You could print out the, the piece that, that's a perfect match and then you shorten recovery times. Uh, you, you make the process a lot easier. Um, so that, that's kind of where this, is, this has been driven uh, to date. I'll talk about why that might not be a, a great thing for the state of technology, but, but, uh, but this is on a metal side. We, we try to interface with all these different groups that are doing work. So we have the material suppliers, the people who are providing metal powders. We have the people who provide the, the equipment and the systems, and then the people who are using it. The aerospace companies, the, uh, the uh, biomedical companies, et cetera. And so there's a, you know, there's a process flow. You, if you, this is where the research really comes in. This is some of the research our metal group is doing. It's looking at this, this flow of, of, of materials. So you have processing uh, things, you have a microstructure, and then you have an effect. And if you can track the data flow through that entire structure, we can determine if there's a defect, where it came from, right? So we're using, uh, trying to identify via big data by tracking all these things all the way through uh, where defects come from. And so, you know, if you have bad material in, uh, if your powder comes in with porosity in it, then you'll have porosity in your final part, right? So these are things that you wouldn't think of. You know, one powder seems like another powder, seems like another powder, but it really is important about the, the, the quality of your feedstock. There's other things that we're doing uh, on the middle additive side. This is a couple years old now, but, uh, now there's, there's a big problem with qualification of parts, right? So if I make a part using additive manufacturing, how do I know it's gonna withstand the forces it's gonna see in, in application? So this is a, a process that was used, uh, that we, we developed for RCAM, and now this ships on every one of their pieces of equipment. Essentially every layer, you take a near IR image of that layer, and then you do that over and over again for the entire part, and at the end, uh, you get a model. And it shows you where all the defects are in your part, right? And so if you can have that model, then you can at least give a, you know, a preliminary thumbs up, thumbs down, is this going to be a good enough part for end use? Uh, and now we're working on uh, tracking all that information in real time. So this is uh, high speed infrared thermography. Uh, this is ongoing work on the RCAM systems. But you can see down here, this is a a little transition from uh, support material to the actual part, you can see there, there's voids that have been formed, right? And so if we can track it in real time, uh, we can identify if that part is qualifiable or not at the end of build, but the eventual goal is to be able to wrap the loop around it and say, can I reprocess that layer to improve the quality of the material? Um, some other things that we get to do, uh, which is great, you know, we can leverage the capabilities of SNS and Hyper. Uh, and so this is a, a video of a, of a turbine blade that was manufactured uh, and something that you can't do any other way. Uh, we're gonna do a, a virtual fly through of this part. All right, so we can, using, using the SNS, we can actually get a picture of what it looks like in the inside and go in and inspect for surface finish, uh, for residual stress uh, and defects on the inside of, of a small part that you'd never be able to, to do 
uh, visually. <laughs> so you can see we're, we're kind of flying through the internal structure of this part. And then eventually you'll be able to see as we make this corner here, you can actually see the layers in the print. And then we'll fly out one of the ports in the outside here. And this was done, done uh, via the computational services guys and, and the guys at SNS. Um, but it tells you exactly you know, what we're capable of now um, for inspection of these parts uh, using the great neutron sciences that we have at Oak Ridge. Um, this is a more recent work uh, used on the metal additive side uh, that the metal additive, additive guys have been working on. Um, one of the capabilities you have with additive that you don't have with any other manufacturing technology is that um, I am locally controlling uh, the, the, prop, the properties of my, my deposition. Right? So if I'm melting, I, I'm locally controlling how and when I melt something. Right? And so if I apply energy, heat it up, melt it, and then I go away for a little while, I come back, I keep it warm, I go away, I come back, keep it warm, I can locally control the rate of cooling. Right? In doing so, uh, if you can locally control the rate of cooling, just like when you're manufacturing something and you quench it in oil or you or you, you let it cool down naturally, you can adjust the grain structure of the parts. So I can locally control the material properties that I'm going to get out of it. So this block uh, that you see in the middle of the screen looks like a, any normal block that you would manufacture. This was 3D printed. And if you look at the micrograph, uh, the microstructure, the grain orientation map through the entire part, it says DOE. Right? And so what that means is that the, the places where you see the different color, the grain orientation is different. That means it has a completely different material property than the, than the parts that are red. Right? So this is something that you have with, with additive that you don't have with any other technology is the ability to locally control the material property. So say you have that bracket that's going to go on an airplane, and I'm worried about fatigue growth. So if I have a crack that forms, it's going to go somewhere, and that might be a, a disastrous consequence. Say my, my control elevator, you know, no longer works on my aircraft. All right, but this is saying that we can adjust the grain structure, which means that we can actually control the way that that fatigue crack is going to form, and we can divert it somewhere in the part that won't be catastrophic. All right, so that's a, that's a huge capability, uh, and to date, it's still un, untouched. We, we can't actually, we don't have the software, believe it or not, to be able to do this. All right, so we've, we've, all, we've just hard-coded these, these, these simple examples, but we need a, um, a better way of actually generating the tool paths for these parts so that we can encode this kind of information in the future. And so there's this, you know, additive has been driven by material science and it's been driven by machines, um, but soon there's gonna be the software revolution in additive uh, that's gonna bring the software up to date so we can actually start looking at microstructure control. Uh, if you have more, any more questions about metal additive, I'm gonna switch over to polymers and to large scale. Uh, but Dr. Ryan Dayhoff, he's a group leader for the material science deposition group. Um, he's been leading most of the metal additive work, so he'd be the right guy to contact. And if, you, if you're really interested in that and you want to work with them next summer or something, let me know and I'll put you in contact with them. On the polymer supply chain, we're doing the same things. We're interacting with the material suppliers, the, the equipment suppliers, and the end users. Um, and polymers uh, are generally a little bit different. There's, there's two types. There's thermoplastics, oh, then there's thermosets. Um, and the thermosets often have a, a photo cure to them. Uh, so the one that you're familiar with is a fused deposition modeler, and that's the one that most of the desktop systems work on. Essentially, you take a wire of material, you heat it up, and then you, uh, like a glue gun, you drive it around robotically to, to lake a layer. Um, and so on the polymer side, we're working on many of the same things that the metal side is working on. In situ characterization and control, materials development, uh, and then trying to get isotropic material properties so that the materials are the same uniformly throughout the entire part um, rather than layer by layer uh, defects. Um, and one of the main things that we've done, uh, that was research that was led here, uh, was looking at adding carbon fiber to the material. So instead of printing a, a, a neat polymer matrix, can we add uh, carbon fiber, change the coefficient of thermal expansion of the material, and allow us to build uh, flatter, straighter, more dimensionally stable parts? And so carbon fiber does some great things. It doubles the strength uh, of the neat material if you add it to ABS. It quadruples the stiffness, so it makes it very stiff. But the main thing is it changes that coefficient of thermal expansion. So 
As I, you think about the way this process works, I heat up material, I put it on top of cold material. And as it wants to cool down, it, it shrinks a little bit. Right, and that pulls on the previous layer, causes it to distort and warp up. So how many of you have printed something at home or, or have a 3D printer? Have you ever noticed that the parts will start to curl on you and warp up off of the build plate? That's the reason, right? It's the cohesion of thermal expansion. So if you had carbon fiber, carbon fiber is this really neat material. It actually has a, a little slightly negative CTE. So as you heat it up, it shrinks a little bit. And as you cool it down, it expands a little bit. But it's very low, so I start taking out plastic and I replace it with carbon fiber. That means that the CTE significantly shrinks. So as I heat it up, it doesn't want to expand as much, and as I cool it down, it doesn't want to contract as much. It means that I don't impart as much stress layer to layer, which means I can build more stable, dimensionally stable parts. So this is a $500 uh, solid doodle. Uh, unfortunately, solid doodles no longer in business. They uh, they had a, a, a bad business deal with the Chinese uh, in about six months ago. But, they, but that's a $500 machine. Uh, the machine I showed you over here, this is a Fortis 400. It's a $250,000 machine. One of the projects we had, we, we printed with carbon fiber on this machine, the same part that we printed on that machine uh, with neat material on this one. We laser scanned them, compared them to the CAD model, uh, did deviation analysis. That one was closer. Right, so by changing the material composition, you can really make a huge impact on the overall part quality. Right, you say, that's, that's really cool, um, but, but nobody's doing it yet. And so you're starting to see on the, the desktop models that people are starting to print with carbon fiber reinforced materials, with glass fiber reinforced materials, with metal polymer reinforced materials. Um, and so the, the next wave of innovation in this space is going to be materials innovation followed by software. I, I, I'm convinced. Um, and so, this is a, you know, there's some residual issues in additive manufacturing. Uh, it's not all uh, great, there are, there are some, some limitations. Right, so additive manufacturing to date is pretty slow. Right, so you say, if I'm going to forge something, or if I'm going to cast something, or if I'm going to machine something, generally it's pretty quick. You can get good turns if, 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 you, if you set up an assembly line. Right? Uh, but added manufacturing, the deposition rate's around one to two cubic inches of material an hour, right? So that's pretty slow. Uh, and then it's expensive. Materials cost, if you buy it from the, the companies, they have like an inkjet model where you, know, you buy the printer and then you also buy the materials from them and so they can, they can charge a lot for the materials. And they transfer all of the unknowns about the process of the materials, so it's a very high specification of materials. About $50 to $200 a pound, depending on which material that you're talking about. And then you can only make small, small parts. So the largest workspace is this Fortis 900 uh, for the FDM systems. It has a build volume of about three feet by two feet by three feet tall. And doing some basic math, that's about 31,000 cubic inches. If I went at one cubic inch an hour, uh, it'd take three and a half years to fill up that entire volume, right? It would be prohibitively expensive. It would be a very expensive problem, part. But you would never do that, right? So you design for additives. You design to reduce the amount of material you use the, uh, and make it a complex structure. Um, so we, we looked at this and we said, what's, what's keeping us from, from solving these, bear, these challenges? And it came down to the material feedstock. Um, but this is kind of our, our initial foray into additive as a robotics group. We were looking at uh, one of our engineers, Randy Lind, uh, he's, he's a brilliant mechanical engineer. He came up with the idea in 1992 that you know, with these robotic systems, you could use them to, to push out concrete and build houses or build concrete structures. All right, and so that, this was some initial work that our group had done uh, about 15 years ago, looking at automated deposition of concrete. Uh, and so we said, you know, when, when we were looking at additive, why can't we go larger like we did with the concrete stuff? So Lockheed had a project at the time, they were looking at uh, tooling. And so by tooling I mean shapes that you can bend sheet metal over, that you can lay up carbon fiber on top of. Uh, if you're a Lockheed and you're going to make a prototype aircraft, uh, you have to invest about $200 million into tooling. Right? And that tooling is just pieces to bend sheet metal over, things to lay up carbon fiber on top of. Right, and if it's the same if you're going to build a you know a car production line. You have to put about two hundred million dollars into stamping dies, into sheet metal forming, stretch forming parts. 
And if you're only making uh, the, the, the break even point for a uh, car manufacturer is about 500,000 cars, right? So I have to sell 500,000 cars before I'm profitable, right? And so Lockheed has to do the same thing uh, when they're making aircraft. If they're gonna make a prototype aircraft, right, they have to invest that $200 million. And then if they're gonna make production aircraft, there's a certain number they have to exceed before they're profitable. And so they were looking at how do I shorten that, that, that production life that I have to have before I become profitable. Can I use uh, for a prototype aircraft, maybe polymer tools, plastic tools? Uh, maybe I won't get as many parts off of it, but I can turn it around quicker. I can get, uh, if I make a mistake, it's not as costly. Uh, and I don't have to invest that, that big chunk at the beginning. So we're looking at trying to build a system with them uh, to, to have a large build on, build very quickly, uh, and then uh, make tools, dyes, and molds with it. And we, we took the lessons we learned in the carbon fiber um, that allowed us to, to change the CTE of the material, so now we can build bigger, right, because we don't have as much stress building up in the parts. And so we changed a couple things about the process. We, instead of, uh, instead of using filament materials, which there's actually a thermodynamic limit on how much material you can push through a nozzle, um, we started looking at pellets, which is an injection molding uh, supply chain. Uh, so we leveraged the injection molding industry. Uh, they produce thousands and millions of tons of these materials every year. Um, we purchased them in thousand pound uh, boxes. You'll go down there, we just got 8,000 pounds in yesterday. Uh, we use an ex extruder head uh, rather than a heated nozzle. So now we, we have a screw inside that's heating up this material and shearing it and creating a, a material flow. So it comes in as solid pellets at the top of this extruder and then out as a mol molten stream of plastic at the end. And then we can use, uh, we, we really up the deposition rates that way. So instead of uh, one to two cubic inches an hour, we're at about 2,500 cubic inches an hour now. Right? So our deposition rates have gone up orders of magnitude. Um, and because of carbon fiber, we're allowed to build larger and larger pieces. Our, our new machine has an eight by 20 by six foot tall build volume. Right? So we can build things the size of a, of a full, spit, full fuselage mold for an aircraft, um, which is kind of cool. And then uh, this is some of our, our initial work uh, looking at tooling for aircraft. Um, so Nav Air, which is, a, which is a naval facility, they, they maintain the Navy's fleets of, fleet of F-18s. They had a, a forklift operator that accidentally punctured the side of one of their F-18s. Right? They don't have the tool uh, because the F-18 was original, the original ones were produced by Donald Douglas, uh, which is no longer in business. They don't have the tool that was used to make that piece. Right? So they said, no, all I need is this shape, I'm gonna stretch form a, a piece of sheet metal over it, uh, and they sent it out for bid, they got bids of $30,000 to make this, this tool, and this is about a you know, yay bid. And so we, we, uh, Yogi at, at Jared Point sent us the part, and said, hey, could you, could you try to print this and machine it? So we, we got it on Monday, we printed it Tuesday, machined it Wednesday, shipped it back to them uh, Thursday, and they pulled a part off of it Friday. Right, so instead of three months and thirty thousand dollars, it actually took us longer and cost us more to ship it to them than it did for us to make it. Right, and so you say that's a big paradigm shift in manufacturing. If you can go from something that takes a long time and costs a lot of money to something that takes very little time and costs very little money, uh, that's it's huge. And so seeing that opportunity, we started a partnership with Cincinnati Incorporated to develop a commercial platform uh, dedicated to doing just this. Um, and so they started working with us in February of uh, 2014. I'm a little bit confused about dates at the moment, <laughs> what year it is. Uh, and, uh, and we had, at the same time, we started working with Local Motors, which is a car company. Uh, if, you're, if you're local, you've, you've probably heard of them. Um, they, they came up to us with this idea that you know, they wanted to revolutionize the way in which you do manufacturing, have locally distributed manufacturing hubs. So okay, that's something that sounds like something great to work on together. Um, and so we set about uh, this idea that we're going to develop a platform and then we're going to print a car, right? And so the two things went hand in hand. We're going to try to you know build this system and then why not demonstrate it by by using it to print a car? So local motor said, okay, well there's this. There's this technology show uh, in, in September, which is, you know, there's 100,000 people that attend it. It would be a really great place to do this. We said, well, it's February, and we have seven months, so sure, why not? 
Uh, and, uh, and so we, we, we went through this whole process. Locomotors, um, let me go back here. Locomotors uh, signed the creative with us uh, in February. Uh, Cincinnati signed it with us in February as well. Uh, we got the first machine in April, and then at that same time, Locomotors decided not only are we going to print a car, but we're going to let the world design it. Right, so we're not going to we're not going to say what the what the design is going to be. We're going to have an open source design competition that's open to the world. Um, and so we finally got the model for the car uh, in July, uh, just two months before the, the trade show. Um, we had to figure out all kinds of things that you would never have to think of, never thought of uh, on, on small scale systems. Like uh, one of the big ones was support generation. Right, so if I have one, the way these, these systems typically work is I have two materials. One that's the app, the part, the, the actual part is made out of, the other one is the support material, and it's dissolvable usually. Right, so I print with that material to support anything that goes over a 45 degree angle as I'm printing out, and then at the end I put it in this bath and it dissolves away. Um, but we don't have two materials for this system, we only have one. Um, so we were trying to figure out you know, how can we get this support material to break away from the actual structure. If I just make it out of the same material, it, it, it gets stuck pretty hard and then I have to saw it away. Um, and so one of our interns uh, two summers ago said, hey, why don't we use some sort of release agent between the layers? So as every, pl every place the support column touches a part, I put in uh, some sort of powder. Uh, and so we used baby powder. Um, and this was the, the first day we had it working. It's about two in the morning. Whoa! So you can see that this is a fender off of the first three train of cars. Right, so if you if you apply this baby powder right at the right at the seam, it sticks enough to hold, and then you can just karate chop it right out. So that's kind of a we were a little excited. That was a, that was kind of a good breakthrough. But but James, you see on the left on the left there, he uh, he was one of our interns, and now he works full time for Local Motors on, on their new uh, uh, car technology. So they just released a, a new autonomous driving self driving vehicle that's uh, a bus for, for getting people around in urban environments. Um, so they're they're using this technology not only to print directly print vehicles, but to make tools for printing for making vehicles as well. Um, and then we set apart, so on, on, on printing some, some cars, and so the, the test pieces, we had some issues, right? Whenever you're doing research, it's not going to go the way you plan, right? And so this is um, about a month before the, the actual conference we were going to print the car. You can see that this wouldn't have been a very good showing. Um, and the problem was that we were, you know, we were only doing 10 pounds of material an hour instead of... Uh, instead of what we needed to be doing. So every layer was about 45 minutes. The plastic had plenty of time to cool down. And then once polymers have cooled below their glass transition temperature, they lock up and they don't want to bond to the next layer. All right, and so you have to keep everything hotter. So we said, how can we keep it hotter? We started working with an extruder expert who said, well, if we just increase the deposition rate, if I just go faster, everything won't have as much time to cool down. So we started working with them on redesigning the extruder uh, and, and we, in about two months, we had a new extruder uh, screw, which uh, allowed us to triple the deposition rate, and that's what brought us to, this is actually live video um, from the International Manufacturing Technology Show where we actually printed the car. So you can see that this, this is the printing process, this is the first strategy that was created. And then this is the, uh, the actual vehicle, uh, made it into a bunch of cool things. Uh, which is which is great, um, and at the same time, you know, we had uh, we had our sponsors there from, from from DOE, and they said this is great. We got lots of publicity for printing a car. Uh, everybody knows what, what kind of cool work Oak Ridge is working on. Um, but we had this vehicle technology office. So if you look, if, the, if you've heard anything about the way DOE is structured, we have the energy efficiency renewable energies EERE, and under that there are a bunch of different. Uh, program offices. So we're, we're sponsored by what's called the Advanced Manufacturing Office. There's a vehicle technology office, there's a building technology office, there's wind and water power, there's solar. Um, and so you know, a lot of these groups don't talk to each other very much. Uh, so we had you know, the NTRC, which is the vehicle technology office, is sitting right next to the MBF, and we had never collaborated on a project before. We said this would be a great opportunity, you know, we're building cars now, 
Uh, can we can we collaborate? Uh, if you look at the way that vehicle technology uh, office or the the NTRC usually developed a new uh, product or a new uh, technology, they would buy a donor vehicle, uh, they would tear it apart, and then replace the vehicle systems as they as they needed, and then test it uh, using you know a Nissan Leaf or something like that. So this was an opportunity. DOE said. Can we build a lab on wheels? Can we start from the ground up and build a vehicle system custom to the to the vehicle itself? And so we were told uh, in, in November, let's build a car for the Detroit Auto Show to, 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 to demonstrate some of the new vehicle technology we've been working on. So the Detroit Auto Show was January. Uh, and we, were, we started in November saying, okay, we need to build a car. I, we're, my, myself, Randy Lind, and uh, my boss, Lonnie Love, we all decided, okay, well, we're going to have a you know, quick one-week design competition. Who can build the best car? And so we sat down, we started designing. We realized really quickly we weren't car designers. Uh, everything came out looking like a, a Pinto or... <laughs> it was not going to be good. Um, and so we, at about, about the, the one-week mark, we said, okay, we got to cheat. we got to find some, somebody who's designed a car before. So we started looking online, and on, on, a, on a website, we found somebody who had done a really beautiful model of a Shelby Cobra. Right? He said, okay, it's a SolidWorks model, we've got it, all right, we're gonna start from there. And so we, we, we brought it into SolidWorks, we had built a frame around it, we, we expanded it out to fit the vehicle systems, and just like that, we had a car design in about a week, uh, and then we went about printing it out. But at the same time, the, uh, the vehicle technology guys were, were developing the drivetrain and powertrain for it. And so, in a total of about six weeks, you can see the different processes. That's printing the frame in the, in the top, and then assembling uh, on the bottom left, and then painting on the bottom right. Uh, in about six weeks, we went from not having anything to having a, a car, right? And we did that because we didn't have to have any tools, right? We didn't have to have any forms to bend sheet metal over. We didn't have to have anything to make composites with. We could print it all out directly. Um, so these are some of the pieces. You can see we had kind of a, a skins, the frame. Uh, we had some support structure underneath the frame. We had kind of a tub that we put together. And then the vehicle systems bolt on to the front and the back of the system. Uh, and then once it's all painted, it looks like a real Shelby Cobra. It's a fully functional electric vehicle. Uh, it's actually in the uh, American Museum of Science and Energy right now in, in downtown Oak Ridge. I, I highly suggest you guys go take a look at it um, before it leaves in August. Um, and then uh, this is uh, the, you know, we had this opportunity right before it left. The president and vice president were coming into town to, to speak at, at uh, Pellissippi State, and they were going to la launch the new IACME Composites Institute, uh, which Oak Ridge and, uh, and University of Tennessee were are the main uh, partners. Um, and so they came down. And we this is the day we finished it. We drove it over to Techmar, um, and the and the president and vice president. That's my boss, Lonnie. Um, you'll, you'll probably see him, uh, him at some point this summer um, talking about it. So it's not all just demonstration projects, though. There is a lot of fundamental research that's going on associated with this. Um, we're trying to understand the thermophysical properties of these materials, right? So if I, these layer-to-layer -layer bonds, uh, they don't have any carbon fiber in them, right? Because you can't get the fiber to penetrate between the layers. So the best strength you can hope for between the layers is the, that of the meat material. But in plain, it's much stronger. And we want to understand what that does uh, to, the, to the material properties. And so we're trying to do things like uh, infrared imaging to, to track the material temperatures so we can quantify bond strength based on it. This is a project that we had um, with AlphaStar. So I print this car. How do I know that it's not going to fall apart as, a, as I'm driving it? Right, and so this is a, a, a modeling problem. How can I predict the mechanical behavior of this thing uh, as we print it? And so what we've worked on is, uh, say this is the model I have. I, I go ahead and I slice it, I generate all the tool paths. Right? I know what the properties of the process are. I know how much heat I'm putting and where I'm putting it. Can I turn this into a big finite element analysis problem? Track the temperatures through uh, the process determine how much, you know, what the bond strength is going to be based on the temperature or the next time at that position. Uh, and so you can do things like get a, get a time history of the temperature. 
right? I can see that this section is, is warmer because it was completed more recently than this section, which is cooling off. But it has, you know, this section just has a lot of thermal mass to it because it's a big uh, block that was confined. Um, and so I can use this uh, to build up the part layer by layer, and I can analyze where the stresses are going to be, right? And so you can see that nothing very visible here. We actually had a crack back here on the actual car um, when we printed it the first time. Um, and so this is a predictive analysis that allows us to figure out where our high stress is going to be uh, and allows us to determine where, where the likely points of failure are. So it gives us a, a good uh, go, no-go on whether or not this is going to be a successful build or not. So you can see that delamination potential works the same way. All right. So. Uh, the time that I, that I made this presentation up, uh, we were working on the, the large polymer system. Let me see if I can switch to a different presentation and give you a, a couple more things. Uh, but essentially, this one, this one is the new system. If you go over to the MDF, I think the tour is, is coming up soon. Um, and this system is fully operational now. Uh, it's, it's now uh, capable of produ producing parts at about 100 pounds of material an hour rather than about 30 in the previous system. Uh, and we're greater than 2,500 cubic inches of material an hour. Uh, and just last week, last Friday, I was up in Chicago. Uh, we're, in, we're in talks with another company to make a uh, much, much bigger printer, uh, orders of magnitude bigger. Uh, we're talking a build volume of about 130 feet by 25 feet by 25 feet tall, targeting building uh, wind turbine uh, molds and, uh, and nacelles and, and ships for the, for the Navy. Um, so that's going to be pretty exciting. Uh, this is a, another project that we, we did. We did. Um, you can see the house. It's over, uh, over next to the Buildings Technology Research uh, Group in the parking lot. Um, essentially, this is the world's largest polymer 3D printed structure. Let me, uh, I have an actual picture of it somewhere. But the idea here was that, uh, that we had this, this house, and we had a car, and they share energy with each other. Right? So the house has solar panels and a way to store energy. It has a battery pack. It's recycled from an electric vehicle. And then you have a car that has a natural gas um, hybrid engine in it, right? And so the car is electric, and as you use energy, uh, if it was a bright sunny day and you have lots of energy stored from the, from the solar panels, you can use that to recharge the batteries in the car. If it was a really dark and cloudy day and you really want to watch that football game uh, at night and you don't have a lot of power coming into your house, you can use the natural gas generator on board of the car to power the house. Right, and so it's this energy sharing approach for off-grid uh, off style uh, living. Um, so that's the end of this presentation. Let me see if I can find something that had, had the other pictures in it. Um, bear with me for a minute here. So we'll at least have the, uh, the ha a picture of the house in it. But since then, we've made all kinds of cool things. And right now, we're making a, 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 a mold for a baby wind turbine. Uh, there's this facility in Texas called the Swift Wind Farm. It's part of Texas, uh, Texas Tech uh, and, they, and Sandia. And what they want to do is they want to study um, interactions between wind turbines. Right? So if you have this big wind farm, Right, as the turbine takes energy out of the air, uh, as it passes through the wind farm, there are, are vortices and wakes associated with this property, and they want to be able to, to use this small wind farm as a test facility to test the interactions that would happen on much larger uh, wind farms. And so they need a set of custom blades made. Right? And so the way you make blades at the moment 
uh, is, is you have this mold. Right? And the way the mold is made is you take a big block of foam, you machine it, you, you put tooling resin on it, you machine it again, you lay up fiberglass on top of that, you put 10 miles of heating wire throughout the entire structure, and then you flip it over, you put a big steel frame behind it, and you put it, flip it over, and then you've got your mold. And it takes six to nine months, and it costs between two and eight million dollars, depending on the size of the mold uh, to make. And so we're looking at, can you just print it out in sections uh, and make it that way? Um, and so we've got some work going on with TPI at the moment to do that. We're making a, a I call it a baby wind turbine. It's only uh, 50 feet long instead of uh, 50 meters long, but, uh, but it's, it's going together pretty soon. Okay, so a couple more things. This is a, a a career milestone, so I love to show it. This is a uh, Jeopardy. So the minutes to go now. Um, replica has 400. Look again. Oak Ridge National Laboratory created a replica Shelby Cobra <laughs> using this alphanumeric technology. Bobby? Was F1? No. Audrey? What is 3D printing? Yes. Uh, so somebody actually it? got it, which is great. Answer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, I don't have it on here either. All right, well, you'll have to go over and see the house for yourself on the main campus. But uh, are there any questions you guys might have? So you mentioned adding carbon uh, to the, the plastics and to, to reinforce it. Yeah. Does that happen at the extrusion level, or is that like a separate? Uh, so that happens, that's compounded from the manufacturer of the pellets. Okay. Right, so we, we just tell them how much carbon fiber we want in it, and they, they put it together. It's actually a great working relationship we have with a company that's local in Clinton called Techmark. Um, we've worked with several material suppliers, but having them being locally uh, owned and operated means that we can, we can go and ask them for really exotic things that we, <laughs> that we keep doing. We've added graphene to polymers. We, we've gone to the carbon fiber technology facility and gotten you know, uh, low cost carbon fiber compounded it in, and the actual Cobro had some of that in it. Um, we've, we've had them, one of the cool things that we've done recently is we actually, uh, there's a project with the, um, uh, shoot, the magnetics group on main campus. I'm trying to remember the Center for Materials, I can't remember the name of it. Nanophase. <laughs> Nanophase Materials, yeah. CNMS, uh, looking at uh, magnetic structures. And so we, we, we doped uh, some of nylon with about 85% neodymium iron and boron, uh, and, and we can print that out uh, into a shape, and then you can put it in a superconducting magnet, magnetize it, and then you have a huge rare earth magnet, right, of any shape you want. Um, and so we're looking at that for, for, for power generation, for for uh, you know, safety structures inside wind turbines. They're, they're actually really interested in uh, and wind turbines, they, they don't want to, they have these big steel towers. If you ever look at them, there's big steel tower, and they don't want to weld tool them, to them because, uh, because you'll create stresses locally, and that, that really ruins the, the structure of the tower. Right? And so they want to secure all of the stuff on the inside with magnets. Right? So you need these big conformal magnets, so we're going to try to use that for that as well. So there's lots of cool things on the material side that you can do, and that's something that's really being uh, have, we have a lot of work in at the moment. Any other questions? Yeah? Is there similar progress being made on the small side of things? Can you print accurately at the micron scale or smaller? Are there, are there are people that are working on that? Um, you know, our, our, our goal is, is more on the manufacturing side to improve the, the throughput uh, and make it bigger. Uh, but there are lots of research groups that are doing micro manufacturing, so MEM style uh, 3D printing. Uh, in fact, the, the jewelry industry has been using uh, wax casting via 3D printed wax for, for many years now. So most custom rings and, and jewelry is made via 3D printing at the moment. Any more? Yeah. Have you looked into printing Nuclear material or for nuclear applications? We, we, you know, there are some uh, nuclear applications. So one that I can talk about would be uh, 
Uh, like, so the S and S, they need, uh, they need all the neutrons to go in the same direction, right? And so uh, there's an interest in you know, these materials that absorb neutrons to, to make it into a, a beam. And they've got these complicated shapes, right? And so you know, one of those is a, a boron a doped polymer so that you, can, that you can absorb these neutrons and let, let them collimate. Uh, into this, this beam. So we've done some, some work there, but, but we, we try to stick away from as much of that as we can. Uh, there, there is a group from Y12 that works with us, um, and they're, they're, they put a machine in our facility, they're learning how to use it, and they're going to take it back to the Y12 and start working on uh, other kinds of things. Uh, anything else? You mentioned that the software behind this process is still a little behind. Is yeah. that the part that selects up the models and creates the core material and generates the full path, or is that just for uh, the back end analyzing what you've actually created afterwards? Everything. Oh. Right? So <laughs> so if I, if I asked you how many image file formats there have been since 1985, how many would you say there were? I, I think that there's been hundreds. Yeah. Right? You think there's, if you want to save something as an image now, you have like TIFF, PDF, JPEG, you know, PNG, all these SVGs, whatever you want to save it as, you can. Right? In additive manufacturing, we use the STL file, which stands for stereolithography. It's this triangulated approximation of the actual geometry. Uh, and that, that file format has existed since 1985. Right? There's, there has been no change to the way we store geometric information. And the way it works is basically, I, uh, I take, let me see if I can actually, no, I'll, I'll wait on that. Uh, but essentially, I take, I take my model geometry, and then I fit triangular patches to it, right? So I, I create this tessellated mesh version of my part. And then what that allows me to do is I can take a planar intersection with that uh, for, for the layer. And everywhere there was an edge to one of those triangles, I get a point, and that forms a polygon. Right? And then I can design my tool path to fill the space in that polygon. Right? So I do that over and over again. It's a very easy way to, to geometrically define a part. What it doesn't allow me to do is, is encode anything about material properties, color. Uh, I actually, it's an approximation of the geometry, so I, I don't have the true, the true curvature. Uh, it doesn't allow me to, to say, you know, I want this material property here and that material property there. Um, so there's some more file formats that are coming on board now, um, starting to. I still think that they're, that they're lacking. Um, there's the AMF file format, the Added Manufacturing file format, which uh, was released maybe five years ago. Uh, and essentially what it is is a, it's a wrapper that goes around the STL. Uh, so you have that mesh as a core unit, but then you also have the ability at each vertex of the triangle to say what color it is. Right. And then uh, there's another one called the 3MF, which goes beyond that. It's the same kind of wrapper around an STL, but also you can put what material property you want. Um, so they're, they're starting to become more software generated. Um, and if you look, there's been no incentive for the CAD companies to actually adopt them. So if you, like the AMF file format allows you to, to put a normal at each one of the vertices too, so you can have a curved patch instead of just a triangular patch. Uh, but if you look at all the CAD suppliers, they just produce ST, they just produce triangular patches. They don't actually use the curvature information. So there's a lot of, of things just on the file formats that can be improved. Um, we're, we're developing new trajectory planning software as part of, uh, I have a team of interns at the moment doing that, uh, working on, on how do you actually fill the space so that you maximize the material properties that you're going to get out of the part. How do you, how do you execute the, the process in the most effective way. Um, so there's there's a lot of things that are coming. All right. Okay. If you have any questions, or if you want to uh, to talk to me about you know going from from a uh, a, a intern to a researcher, I'd be happy to talk to you. I'll, I'll leave my contact information up here, and you can come talk to me afterwards. Uh, there you go. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, and it was a pleasure. Talking.